Uh, today is Mother's Day. Uh, we've already said it a few times, but I want to say it again. Happy Mama's Day. Uh, we're very, very excited about Mother's Day. We've been preparing for this for quite some time. Uh, thank you. Uh, a number of you have helped me. I realized that um, I have no idea what it takes to put on a service that would speak to the mothers of mission. So Carrie Cook and a number of others kind of helped me like, think about this in a way that we would hope would be very meaningful. Uh, women of mission, as you guys leave today, our hope is that your heart would just be very, very full. Now, not only did we do a little tribute at the beginning of the service, if you came in late, you missed it, you can stay for the 11, uh, that kind of medley of all kinds of stuff, and Tommy Bowman singing Boys to Men, that might be the highlight of my church experience thus far in my Christian life. I've been waiting for that. I've been looking for any opportunity uh, for that. I'm glad he kept the top button buttoned. I appreciated that. Um, so not only do we do that, all right, not only do, do we do that, uh, but also um, what we've been thinking and, and kind of working on is, could we do an event that would be for the ladies of mission? And so we have been saving our pennies, and we are able to do this. It is going to be the last Wednesday of the month of May. It is May 29th, and it is ladies' night, and a few, all right, it's going to happen, all right? It is, it is May 29th. All the ladies are invited. Uh, you're going to see a number of gentlemen dressed up in suits, all right? That's generally not how we dress around here, but if you, you, you can keep doing that if you want. It's all good. Uh, but those dressed up in suits, after the service, see them and get registered for the Mission Ladies Night. It's for all the ladies in the house, kind of above 18 is what we're saying right now. Uh, we have room for 200 people, and our vision for this is, one, we want to celebrate uh, the ladies of this church. We want you to have a great night. It's going to be uh, just, just down the road at Venuti's. We've rented out a ballroom. It's really nice there. You're going to get dressed up to the nines. It's going to be an amazing dinner and sorbet. Uh, I never thought I'd ever say that word publicly. Um, uh, so there's going to be that. There's going to be all kinds of great things. A really good friend of mine, Christy Rudder, is going to come and share a little bit of her journey. You do not want to miss that, I promise. And what we thought is that not only would this be a night for you, ladies of mission, but one of your friends as well. So we have a seat for you and a seat for one of your friends that is not part of our church. It's a great night to build community, laugh, rest, breathe, and not do anything, all right? So men of mission, make this happen uh, for your significant other, all right? Sound good? Uh, the last thing we thought that we could do uh, is not listen to me teach. Uh, for the entire time. And I noticed in Andrea's prayer, she only prayed for God to speak through Kelly. And I'm not offended by that. That's okay. Not sure if you picked up on that either, but I did. Um, but he here's what I thought we could do. Um, I thought it would be an amazing Mother's Day gift to ask my wife to prepare for a message all week. Yeah, I didn't think that through. Um, uh, but I did think, wouldn't it be great if Kelly, my bride, could join me on the stage and together we could talk about what it looks like to be a mother celebrated today. So would you give a mission welcome to Kelly Peacock as she comes. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be with the 930 crew for the first time. I'm normally never with you guys. Good to see you. Yeah, I told you. They're lively. They're not so bad. Not so bad. No, no. They get dressed up. They, most of them shower and everything. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, awesome. So, hey, we were as we were working on this, and thinking through this, I was, I was reminded of my, my favorite little game that I would play as a kid. Now our, our daughters are getting into it. It's the game Hide and Seek. Anyone with me? I got any witnesses? Any of you guys love playing that game? And now I'm like, you know, teaching my daughters how to play it. But when I was a kid, I would pride myself on how good I could hide. Like I would pride myself on how invisible I could really be and how unseen I could be. And if you've played the game, you know that's something that you celebrate. You celebrate your unseedness, right? Uh, but in life, it's way different. In life, you don't celebrate that. In life, you don't celebrate how unseen you are. In life, you don't celebrate when you feel completely invisible. You really don't. And in the Old Testament, as we were thinking through this, we were struck by this character named Hagar in the Old Testament. And Hagar is someone that it's kind of easy for us to kind of breeze right She's kind of an unknown character, but she's part of a very familiar story. Most of you perhaps uh, have heard of uh, this couple named Abraham and Sarah. So they're, they're kind of like a big deal in the Bible, all right? If you go all the way back to beginning, beginning Genesis 12, you'll see Abraham and Sarah. And one day, God says something to Abraham and Sarah that is absolutely crazy. God says to them, through you, I'm going to birth a nation, and through you, there will be as many descendants as like sand on a seashore. 
Now, the reason that was crazy is because Sarah was barren, all right? And what that means is she was not able to have kids. Second to that is she was like 90 years old. And so they hear this from God, and of course they're excited, but at the same time, they're like, now how is that possible? Well, all things are possible with God. And at the same time, they begin to learn that God's timetable is oftentimes very different than ours. You see, 10 years passed, and still Sarah was not pregnant. And what happened is they began to do what you and I often do. They took matters into their own hands. And this is where Hagar really comes into the story. Uh, Oftentimes in the Old Testament and way back in the day, some of the wealthy would have a surrogate kind of mother. So if you were unable to get pregnant, sometimes the slave uh, woman would be the one that would carry the child. And this is exactly what's what's happening in the story. So Hagar gets pregnant by Abraham. And as you can imagine, if you're Sarah, now this begins to raise up all kinds of tension and conflict. Jealousy is all of a sudden in the story between Sarah and Hagar because here's Hagar that is now pregnant carrying this son and all of a sudden this strife and conflict. And what happens is Hagar is then totally rejected. Hagar is like kicked out of this camp. Hagar was in a great situation, but now Hagar finds herself completely alone, pregnant in the middle of a wilderness. So at this point, you're probably wondering why we brought you to church on Mother's Day to depress you with a story of Hagar in the wilderness. But as John said, here she is. She's in this messy situation. Her only option seems to be to flee into the wilderness. And here she is, alone and hidden. And I've been a mom for about three and a half years, so I consider myself very, very far from an expert at this point. But I'm learning a few things. I'm learning that I love being a mom. I love it, and there's so much more joy and fulfillment than I think I could have ever imagined. But I'm also learning that one of maybe the most challenging parts for me is how often you feel like everything you're doing is completely unseen or completely hidden. And as moms, day after day, we're doing thousands and thousands of things that are often completely unnoticed often not awarded, and often not applauded. So I thought to try to give you a picture of what I'm talking about, I would give you a little bit of a schedule of a typical day for me. And I know that every mom in here has a different world, but I'm wondering if some of you may relate to different points of this day. Here is a schedule of a typical day for me. 7 to 7.30, wake the kids up. 7.45, go back to Hannah and tell her, yes, she has to get up. 7.55, start getting them dressed. 8 o'clock, explain to Hannah that no, she cannot wear her ballerina leotard everywhere we go. 8.05, brush teeth. 8.15, fix breakfast. 8.20, try to be patient when they complain about what I gave them for breakfast. 8.30, try to keep control when Hallie dumps her milk on the floor for the fifth time. 8.40, unload dishes. 8.50, race to the car to get to one of our classes at the park district. 9.15, comfort Hallie after one of her many falls of the day. 9.30, take Hannah potty for what will be the first of about 30 times that day. 10.30, run to the store to get a birthday present for one of their friends' birthday parties. 11.30, run home to fix a quick lunch. 11.45, quit the fight that they're having over the doll that they both want and try to quickly explain the value of sharing to them. 12 o'clock, get on the internet while they're eating and balance the checkbook, meanwhile inhaling a sandwich. 12.45, play pretend and dress up, which... I'm being honest now, lately for me has required being Mary Poppins at Hannah's request with the English accent. You can ask John. It happens at our house. True. 145, read stories, put them down for naps. 215, while they're napping, go through mail, pay the bills, throw in a load of laundry, reply to emails, look in the fridge, and figure out what we're going to do for dinner. 345, wake them up, give them a snack. 415, run to the store because I've realized we're out of butter. 445, explain to Hannah why we can't buy the candy in the checkout line. 4.55, barely save Hallie's life because she's figured out how to escape the buckle of the shopping cart and is about to jump out, literally. 5 o'clock, act natural and smile as people are watching when Hallie's screaming because I won't let her jump out of the shopping cart. 5.15, get home, frantically try to make the house look like a tornado has not hit it before John gets home. 5.45, throw dinner together. 6.30, eat dinner, trying to have a meaningful conversation with my husband over screaming children. 7.15, get them in the bathtub, 7.30, last minutes of playtime, 7.45, read stories, sing songs, say prayers, snuggle, tell them goodnight, 8.30, once they're down, finish cleaning the house, 9 o'clock, 
bake a treat for an event that we have tomorrow while at the same time making phone calls that I needed to throughout the day. 9.45, finish folding the laundry. 10 o'clock, talk to John and do things that help us be a happy married couple. 11 o'clock, <laughs> like Scrabble, for, for board me. games, things like that. Stuff like that. 11 o'clock, hit the pillow, start all over the next day. So I'm thinking with all of that, ladies, we need Mother's Day like once a month. Don't you think so? <laughs> but no, seriously, if I'm honest, there are times in my brokenness that I desperately want someone to walk around behind me and say, way to go, way to go with all the things that you're doing, way to go, and just acknowledge those things. If I'm honest, sometimes I just want someone to say, what you did today mattered. What you did today counted. And the truth is, encouragement from our families is really important. And it is important to give those words of gratitude. But if I'm always looking for validation from people, especially in this hidden role of motherhood, we're going to pretty much feel a lot of dissatisfaction and a lot of discouragement. Because I'm going to be honest, I have really good children, but Hannah's three now, and she has yet to sit me down and say, Mom, I just want to Thank you for that way you're consistently disciplining me to make me a responsible child. <laughs> Has not happened. And this man is a very amazing husband, possibly one of the best in the room. Tell but, us more. But Tell we, more. no, I think that's enough. I think that's enough. We've been married six and a half years now, so you still can do this. But I have yet to experience a standing ovation when I bring the laundry up or when I bring the groceries in. So, but if you want to do that, you can. So this is what I mean by the hiddenness of motherhood. And some of the things we do as moms are great and fun and life-giving. And some of the things we do are incredibly challenging and draining. But most don't seem earth-shattering, and most will not be awarded. So this is where I think we find ourselves in the story of Hagar. Because here she is, alone, feeling completely unseen. And she realizes that all is not seen by the eyes of men. But what she's about to see is that all is seen by the eyes of God. Yeah, it's, it's in this wilderness, and Kelly and I were talking about the, the size of this wilderness. You can study on your own, but it was absolutely massive. Armies literally got lost in this wilderness. And, you know, place yourself in the story. Some of you are carrying a, a child right now. I, I'm not going to name who you are, but... Some of you are ready to, to give birth to your, your, your child here, here shortly. Imagine being alone, terrified, completely left kind of to your own deal in the middle of this massive wilderness. And, and it's right here in the story of Hagar that we see this first thing, that all is not seen by the eyes of man. I mean, she knew that. I mean, she really was invisible by the eyes of man. But at the same time, we see this incredible truth within the story of Hagar, that while all is not seen by the eyes of men, all is seen by the eyes of God. And up until this point, she had been referred to as slave. But all of a sudden in the wilderness, God begins to call her out by name. I mean, it's this beautiful thing that begins to happen in the story. He begins to refer to her by her first name. I mean, so much dignity was beginning to happen within that. Another incredible thing that happened uh, within the wilderness is, it's here in the text where she actually names God. She names God, first one to do that. And what she names God is this, this Hebrew word, uh, word uh, El Roy, or El Roy. And what that means is the God who sees. It's in the wilderness where she learns these two things. All is not seen by the eyes of man, but all is seen by the eyes of God. Mm. Yeah, and I really encourage you guys to study this passage of Scripture. It really is incredible. And it was as I was reading this that I really did feel a strong sense that this is what God was putting on our hearts to share with you. Because the reality is, no matter who you are as a mom, there will be moments that are greater and better than you could have imagined and moments that are going to be more challenging than you could have imagined. But what I want you to leave here remembering is that you are seen by God. You are seen by the eyes of God. And I know in a room like this, it would be impossible to address every single situation specifically. But I do want to take a few minutes to talk to a few different groups of people. The first group I want to talk to is the women who are here 
who long to be mothers, and for whatever reason, that has not been possible for you. And I know that days like today can intensify that pain. And I know that days like today can intensify that ache. And I just want you to hear that God sees you. And God sees the pain you feel when friend after friend seems to get pregnant effortlessly. And he sees the tears that you cried when you had another negative pregnancy test. And he sees the hurt you feel when people don't understand and maybe say words that hurt. And he sees the pain that some of you feel who had hoped and expected to be married and starting a family by now, and that's just not happening for you yet. He sees you. And there's another group here of single moms, and I want you to know that God sees you and that anyone who's not in that situation could never imagine the weight of that load. And God sees you trying to be two parents in one, and he sees when you feel that the needs always seem to exceed what you have to offer. And he sees those moments when you feel misunderstood or judged. And he sees those nights when you feel isolated and alone. His eyes see you. And some of you today, today is a little bit painful because it reminds you that your own relationship with your mom is less than what you would desire for it to be. And you would desire for your relationship with your mom to be one that is close, and instead it's one that is strained. You desire to feel that love from your mom, and yet instead you often feel that you're not quite enough, or you're not quite who she wants you to be. Or because of undealt with pain in her own life, she hasn't been able to care for you because she really can't take care of herself. And because of that, there's pain, and I want you to know that God sees. God sees the times that you needed to feel love from her, and you didn't. And God sees the times that you longed for her comfort, and it wasn't there. And God knows the words that you long to hear from your mom and have not heard. He sees that. He sees And some of you today is challenging because you have a strained relationship with a child. And you have a child that you have done all you can to love or to point towards Christ. And for whatever reason, they've chosen to turn away. And your heart is breaking because you have a sense like something you've done has failed or a sense that what you gave was not enough. And I want you to hear today, Mom, that God sees you. And that even if that child has rejected those efforts of love, that God has seen every one. And that even if you felt that those efforts of love and guidance have dropped, that he has received every one. That not one has fallen. That he has received it, that he has cherished it, that he has treasured it. And some of you here are not mothers, and you don't feel called to be mothers. And I want you to know that God sees you, and that you have a place here, and that you don't need to feel like less of a woman because you're not a mom. And I want you to know that you have something very valuable to offer the families around you, that even if you're not a mom, you can be making life-altering investments in children around you as an aunt, as a mentor, as a spiritual mother, God sees you and you have something valuable to offer. And some of you, today is a day you've been looking forward to because you are expecting a child this year. Or some of you, you've brought home a baby this year. And this is a day that we celebrate with you. Or some of you are in a season where your relationships with your children are close and life-giving, and we celebrate that. Know that God sees you, and he celebrates with joy with you. From the littlest mundane thing to the most painful, heart-wrenching experience to the fullness of gratitude, our prayer is that you will sense the eyes of God on you, and that El Roy, the God that we see in Genesis 16, would be that same God to you today, 
that you would know that he knows. He knows what others don't know. And he sees what others don't see. And he understands what others do not understand. And as we thought about, you know, what, what can be something that we can apply as a church, we're very committed to making sure that, you know, man, that, that what we talk about on this stage plays on Monday, that it has an impact Monday through Saturday. And so you know, what does this look like to begin to apply this story to our, our everyday life? And there's a couple things. The first thing is this. Some of you, you just really need to hear, keep doing what you're doing, all right? Like, you don't need to go home and, like, start doing all kinds of other things. Keep doing what you're doing. I, I would argue she's knocking it out of the park, and what that means is that you're doing a great job. I mean, she's doing, she's doing an awesome, awesome job, and, and that was part of my heart as, as we're working on this. I just wanted to say, Kelly and, and moms of mission, and those of you that aren't moms that are investing, like Kelly has said, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep making those investments. God sees them. Perhaps you haven't been high-fived yet, all right, or congratulated, but God sees every single one of those investments. Keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we recently stumbled across some home videos um, from when I was a child. We were doing some things to get ready for my mom's 60th birthday, and it was really fun to kind of re-watch some of these things. And as I did, I noticed that I was kind of now watching it from a different lens. And as I was watching it now, I started paying more attention to my mom. And I started watching the ways that she interacted with us and her demeanor and her presence. And I started watching the little things that she was doing that I had never noticed before. And my mom isn't and wasn't perfect, but my mom really is my hero. And I am striving to be half as amazing of a mom as she is. And when I was watching that, it was in these everyday moments. It wasn't life-shattering moments. It was playing at the park, playing dress up, going swimming. But she was there. She was there. And I was watching the way that she was making thousands and thousands of little deposits into our lives through her looks, through her touch, through her words, through her presence. She was communicating something to us that we were safe and that we were loved. And that mattered. So parents, I want you to hear today that those thousands of tiny investments you're making, they matter. They really, really matter. And the last thing we want to just encourage you with is for you to continue making these investments, for you to continue to have something worth investing. You have got to intentionally and consistently get alone and fix your eyes on the God whose eyes are on you. We have to look upon the eyes of the one who sees us. And this is partly what I noticed from the story of Hagar, that circumstances were not perfect before her encounter with God, and circumstances actually were not all perfect after her encounter with God. He actually told her to go back to the situation that was causing her pain. And this word that he tells her preparing her for the life of her son was not exactly great news. But the thing that makes all the difference in the story of Hagar is she sees the God who sees her. And that is what gives her the courage to go back into that situation. And that is what will give us the courage and the selflessness that motherhood will require of us. And I know that we're different and how we get replenished will look differently and that's good. But each one of us has to slow down enough to try to, to catch how God is wanting to get our attention, wanting to interact with us. We have to quiet ourselves in his presence to be reminded how intimately aware of us he is, that he is not distant, that he is close. For him to remind us what he sees in us and that it is not in all the doing that our value lies, but it is in being a child of God. Some of us may hide behind busyness because we're a little scared of the quiet, of the silence. Some of you, like me, may buy into the lie that you'll go have that time with him once everything on your to-do list is done. And for me, that has never yet happened once. The to-do list is never done. It may look like taking a walk. It may look like opening scripture. It may look like listening to worship music, whatever it is. For me, recently, it was going to Meacham Grove Forest Preserve and sitting for a couple hours. And I didn't realize how busy my mind was until I stopped 
And I literally, after I sat there for a while, felt like there was a racing car coming to this screeching halt. It was, it was crazy. And after I sat there for a little while, I just felt God reminding me that he didn't create me as a robot. He didn't create me to keep pushing and pushing without rest. He didn't create me to ignore these signals that he's given me to know when my body and my soul are tired. That he actually created me to need him, to need to be filled by him, to need to step back and stop so that when I go and have something to offer, I'm very clear that it is because of him in me that I have something to give, not because of myself. And I believe in those times alone with him, you will not only be in awe of the God who sees you, but it will affect what you have to offer the families that you're a part of. So a quick tip to the gentlemen as I close is two awesome Mother's Day gift ideas. The first is please make sure to do everything you can to get your lady to the ladies' night on May 29th. I will be there. John, you're on baby duty. So anybody who wants to hang with John and the girls, you can get together with him, but it's going to be a great night to invest in the ladies of our church. Whether you're a mom or not, if you're a lady in our church, you are invited. Um, And secondly, as men, would you encourage her to go and take this time on her own? Give her that sense that you, give her the illusion that you have it under control while she's gone. (laughs) (laughs) That is well said. Tell her to get away for a few hours every couple of weeks away from expectations, away from to-do lists, away from doing to just be, to be with God, to be replenished. And ladies in the house, mothers in the house, whether you're a biological mom, an adoptive mom, a spiritual mom, I just pray that today you will feel seen and that you will feel honored and that you will feel celebrated because we are so, so thankful for you. And we are who we are because of you. So let's pray. God, I just thank you. I thank you for being the God who sees us. And I just pray that in this moment, everyone in this room, whether child or adult, man or woman, would leave with a very real sense that they are seen by you. That you are not distant, that you are not removed, that you are not unaware, that every sacrifice, every investment, every deposit of love is seen by your eye. And God, I pray that we would look to you to validate us, that we would look to you to identify us, God, I pray for the moms in this church that it would be a place where they can be honest about the less than perfect world of being a mom and that they would find grace and understanding. God, I just pray for those who have been running on empty for way too long. That in this moment even, they would sense you calling them to yourself, calling them to rest, calling them to stop, the striving and to simply be with you. We love you, God, and we thank you that all is seen